Around 1971, I was in the professional beauty industry for the first time, and I was assigned here to Austin, Texas. That's where the major distributor was. Cool town, had a little apartment on Manor Road, and went to this really neat place called the Armadillo Headquarters. I was kind of impressed because they had country there, they had blues there, they had rock and roll in the same place in a nice little hippie environment. Come the early 1990s, I run across this beautiful girl from Houston and then later on from Austin. And one night I was at the House of Blues with her and Willie Nelson was there. And she said, you want to meet Willie? I said, I'd love to meet Willie, but I don't know him. Uh, she says, let me introduce you to Willie Nelson. We went outside and there's the bus. And I thought, they're not going to let her in. Anyway, she knocked on the door and uh, this big guy came out, happened to be Pootie. I met him later on. And he said, yes. And she said, oh, I'm here to see Willie. Would you please tell him that Eloise is here? He says, we well, can't be disturbed. He's going to go on. And then a voice in the background, it's Willie Nelson, says, Eloise, is that you? Yeah, Willie, it's me. Boom, I'm on the bus with Willie, on Willie's bus. He's getting ready for the show. Fabulous guy. I met Willie, and uh, God, what a nice fellow from the greater Austin area. <laughs> <laughs> Meeting Willie is always fun. We have, well, I, uh, I've been coming to Austin since, I think, the early 70s. It's always been probably my favorite music town because the audiences are so in tune. I think people like Willie probably helped that out. Stephen Bruton moved here after we did the movie Songwriter. I'm afraid you stepped in it this time, boy. Doc, can you talk to him, the crazy son of a bitch? I expect this will be a good lesson for you. I think he was here for the rest of his life. How far back do you and Stephen go? Oh, over 40 years. He was just a baby when he came to, <laughs> to work with me, the best guitar player I ever had. Chris, it's always a pleasure seeing and being with you, my friend. I've got to get back down on the road to Austin. Well, it's a good day to ride. <laughs> I'll see you down the road. It's been a long road. A long road from where we are to where we were back then. A road that cuts through time like a knife through pie. The road to Austin was more than a concert on a single stage for a few isolated hours. I remember the road to Austin as much for the show as the six, seven days of rehearsals, because that was, I mean, it was like going back to school in a way, you know. I had no idea that people were gonna be coming in from all over the country, musicians, uh, songwriters, everybody that contributed, the camera people. It was a big show. I remember getting a call from Stephen and uh, him wanting, need to be a part of this thing uh, that he's putting together. And I'm thinking, okay, you don't say no to Stephen. You know, whatever it's going to be, it's going to be cool. I knew it was going to be right. I knew the band was going to be good. Ten-piece rock and roll band, you know. Steve Bruton, David Grissom, Eric Johnson. Can't hardly go wrong there. The cross-section of different musicians that Stephen had brought together, I think he tried to bring a smattering of all the styles in Austin and kind of in, in Texas for that matter. When you went into the rehearsals, you could tell that there was a, there was a force that was driving it that was beyond just the music, you know, and, and, and I wasn't sure what was going on at first, you know, but I, could, I felt very pulled into it. We were all 
felt like Martians without a passport in there. There were so, so many different styles of music. Uh, what, was, what was before us in the way of, of the program was massive. From the very beginning, the whole concept of the thing would be a nonstop freight train, if you will. You try to capture lightning in a bottle. You only have a finite amount of time to grab things. But these people were all the cream of the crop in catching lightning in a bottle. One thing about Stephen was that he had more close friends than anybody I've ever known in my life, um, which speaks volumes to his character. It was really a family event, truly, in, in the sense that everybody involved in the event was part of a big family. That there really was no line of demarcation between Chris, Bonnie, Delbert, and the guys that were building the stage. Sitting next to Christofferson when Kara Johnson, the opera singer, was doing her uh, aria, she got down and there's this pregnant pause before everybody started to clap and Christopherson looked around and said, damn, I was gonna sing that song. I've heard uh, Elvin make it through the night my whole life. My dad's a musician, he plays guitar. I've heard it a thousand times at least. But watching Chris Christopherson and Steven play and he strums that guitar and starts like that first line, take the ribbon from your hair. Take the ribbon from your hand. And uh, it's like I'd never heard the song before, and I finally like understood it, which is what I love about music. Like, I want to be moved when I watch music, and it happened that night. It was incredible. I took it very seriously, and I and I, and I couldn't have been happier to get to spend that much time um, playing with Stephen and, and all of his friends, and it was just an inspiring experience on every level. The road to Austin is more like a part of a long continuum, reaching back no one really knows how far. Back before the millennium, before 6th Street, before Stevie Ray Vaughan, and even Mr. Joe Ely. You it leads back before the Cosmic Cowboys, before Willie even thought about a picnic before Elvis sang at the Sports Center, or Janice was singing a revolution at the New Orleans Club. Back to a time when Kenneth Threadgill actually pumped gas at his service station. Back before the Armadillo World Headquarters and the Vulcan Gas Company, and before Schultz Garden, and back to a time before Austin had a name or was even constructed. The music we know today rose from the back alley bordellos, honky-tonk saloons, and the German beer gardens of a hard scrabble town in the middle of nowhere. Brought here by a collection of desperados, rogues, and classically trained German musicians who had nothing in common but their rebellion against the ordinary and their gift for expressing themselves in music. In 1870, German music entrepreneur William Besser opened Austin's first music store on what is now 6th Street, where musicians gathered for informal jam sessions, a precursor to the garage bands of later years. If you go back to the Middle Ages, um, music was a way of telling stories and passing on information. It always was. If you look at the wandering minstrels of Europe, most of the stories of Europe and the communications in Europe were done by wandering minstrels or wandering bands of players. So music has always been a vehicle to transmit new ideas and, new, and to move cultures around. As the years passed, Austin became a crossroads for many musical traditions. Musicians refused to be forced into anything even remotely resembling conformity. Instead, musical styles evolved in all directions. Folk music came riding the rails out of the Great Depression with Jimmy Rogers and took root in the clubs and coffee houses of Austin. Many artists who would go on to become legends enjoyed early success in the favorite watering holes of students from the University of Texas. All the little joints around the university, starting in the heart of the campus, they would bring acts in from the 20s on, cover bands, show bands, bands that uh, made, you know, the sorority and the fraternity guys do their little thing. Tennessee. Influenced by Jimmy Rogers, Kenneth Redgill brought cowboy blues and railroad music together when he converted his service station into a neighborhood bar, 
and became the first to legally serve liquor following the repeal of Prohibition. Uh, Janis Joplin told Chris Christopherson, there's a guy that yodels a lot like Jimmy Rogers, and I really wish you'd cut an album with him someday. Joan Baez came to town and wouldn't come to Threadgill's because she wasn't sure that it was integrated. Mr. Threadgill made sure after that it was integrated, and Mance Lipscomb became one of his best friends. Right away, just come on. The blues has been a part of Austin since slavery days. Forged in the segregated East Austin community where the old masters came to play country, Delta, Memphis, and swamp blues, and were later nurtured at a legendary club called Antones, where local talent like the fabulous Thunderbirds Stevie Ray Vaughan and giants like Muddy Waters and B.B. King came to play for their friend, Clifford Antone. We got to see some of the greats because of Clifford's love for music, the Muddy Waters, the Willie Dixons, and you know, Freddie Hubbard, people like that. And then, you know, as they passed on, the other greats took their place, moved up in, in the Pantheon, and uh, Clifford was always there. In addition to blues, another important element of the East Austin scene has been Latin music. Cumbia, baby. A vibrant sound heard in the streets and clubs of the city since the very beginning. Mariachi, Conjunto, Norteño, and the big Tejano touring bands came north from their roots on the border. Popular Austin artists include such performers as Little Joey La Familia, Ruben Ramos and the Mexican Revolution, and Los Lonely Boys. The civil rights and protest movements of the 1960s sparked new musical styles. Folk began to yield to rock and psychedelics. New bands like the 13th Floor Elevators and venues including the Jade Room, the New Orleans Club, and the Vulcan Gas Company enlivened the psychedelic movement that started not in San Francisco, but here in Austin. It was a movement sparked by the iconoclastic spirit that founded this town and the push to take music and consciousness to a new place. The psychedelic experience started here in the 13th floor elevators were the first band in the world to use the word psychedelic. And uh, they literally left the musical planet. And unfortunately, the system was such that we, uh, we couldn't allow anybody that much freedom. And it cost Rocky Erickson the next, you know, 30, 40 years of his life. Uh, but he's back. He's back strong and he's got a cult following all over the world. In 1970, Eddie Wilson opened the Armadillo World Headquarters. Here, a diverse blend of rock, country, folk, and blues brought people together who had never been easy neighbors. Read a sign on a barn door says the good Lord Jesus saves. For the first time, rednecks and hippies commingled peacefully. This truce between hippies and rednecks would last. Two words, Willie Nelson, because he personified it all. He had the country, he had the hippie, he played the blues, he had the attitude of punks. Uh, he just symbolized and personified it all. The rednecks and the hippies would all go to see a Willie show and they realized, hey, we all like good music, so uh, let's get along, at least for this evening. I'll see you down the highway. Ain't it a great night to be in Austin, Texas? I think this is a town that above and beyond almost anywhere else in America has a commitment to music where music is part of the fabric of the town that you don't have anywhere else. We chose Austin, and the end result was it's the best thing we could have done for our son. Fabulous education, fabulous family values. Austin is right through the ecology movement, and we just happened to really score with the music capital of the world, man. Feeling good was easy, Lord, Bobby sang the blues. 
It's been a long, long road. And along this road have traveled many of the most honored names in the worlds of country, folk, blues, and rock. Musicians who lived chapters of their lives here, performed and recorded here, or left a part of their hearts here. Names from A to Z, from Asleep at the Wheel to Frank Zappa. These are the sights and sounds that have made Austin the live music capital of the world. But there's something else that contributes to this reputation, something we have here that's unlike anything else, anywhere else in the world. And that's the Austin audience. Well, the Austin audience is just, you know, is for some strange reason, part of our legacy. You know, there's something in the water, something in the DNA, they get a little bit loose. I would describe the Austin audiences as discriminating and discerning. Hard to please, that's the best way I can think of an Austin audience. And I think it's because the Austin audiences generally are a little more aware of music. We have such good music here that our standards are very high. Uncommon gatherings in places like the Broken Spoke, the Continental Club, and the hallowed ground of the Saxon Pub that are diverse, knowledgeable, passionate, nonconformist, abounding with a spirit that's part outlaw, part hedonist, and completely alive. The road to Austin was truly an unforgettable evening. It brought together musicians that might not have uh, shared a stage under any other circumstance other than the fact that they were all connected to Bruton. It was a very bittersweet event. You know, when everything finally started to come together. To get that phone call, and I, I remember it like it was yesterday, and it's kind of frozen in time, when, you know, you're four months out, to find out that Stephen was diagnosed with cancer. Stephen was sick when this started. By the time that the show happened, it, it, was, it was instead of being about all of these many 60-something people that came to perform, it, it all became about celebrating Stephen's life. The initial feeling that I had was that this was bigger than I thought it was going to be. And I was so glad I got to play with my friend. And it just turned out to be so special in my life. On my deathbed, this would be one of the things I remember doing is the road to Austin uh, because of, you know, because of Stephen. And if you got somebody around you who is a great musician and, a, and has a great sense of humor and is a real person like Stephen was, uh, it really adds a dimension to your life that uh, I'll be grateful for till they throw dirt on me, you know. It's just that he's one of the most important people in my life. I just wish he'd stuck around a little longer.
Boston All-Stars. Let's hear it for them. It's going to be that good all night long. For the full length, three and a half hour DVD and Blu-ray featuring all 37 performances. Visit the Road to Austin website at rtafilm.com.